and uh, we've been looking at a little set here all about the Word of God. And we started two weeks ago with Psalm 119, which starts, Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. So there's an idea here uh, that the writer of Psalm 119 wants to make sure we understand that there is blessing in following the word of God and walking in his way. In fact, goes on to say, blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. So this is something we should really throw ourselves into, to have this desire to follow the will of God. And that will of God has been set down for us. Um, he has given us his word, this instruction we need. Therefore, we should, as it says in those first few verses, take heed to it. We should uh, seek to stay on that right path of the word of God. We should hide it in our heart. And there's a promise in there that all those who put their trust in the word of God, who follow the word of God, will not be ashamed. But instead, will actually, we know, be blessed. Uh, it is the better way to go. And that's something we have to kind of keep driving into our head because it does not come natural just to trust that God knows best. His word is right. Uh, we, for some reason, going back all the way to the garden, for some reason, somebody will come along and say, no, that's not true. And we'll be, mm, oh, maybe. <laughs> uh, it's something we have to fight with, huh? Just to know God's word is right and it is best for us. Then we saw last week from 2 Peter chapter 1, 15 through 21, what makes this word of God, this Bible, these scriptures, so much different uh, than all those other quote-unquote holy books out there, those other spiritual books, those other quote-unquote truths out there. And we saw as Peter kind of laid it out very clearly, uh, we need to study, we need to remember this because these are not cunningly devised fables. This isn't something they just made up about a guy by the name of Jesus. This isn't something they just made up about God. These are actual, based on eyewitness accounts of the glory of Jesus Christ. That he did those miracles, that he did have that testimony from the Father. They even saw him, Peter and James and John, saw him glorified. They saw him die, but they also saw him what? Risen again. And then ascend up to heaven. With all of his promises and all of that, we know this isn't just a fable. This is based on eyewitness accounts. It is, in fact, the truth, right? Not only that, but uh, he goes on to say this is not of some private interpretation. All of it, going all the way back to the first books of the Bible. These aren't just some private interpretation. This is not just some private idea that they came up with in the middle of the night, a small group of people or an individual that said this would be a, make a good story. This would be a good idea. This is what we ought to teach people. But instead, it is in fact the word of God. Uh, that people were moved to write these things and is the word of God. And we can see that. It's, it's, a lot of people will say, well, yeah, sure, it says that, but how do you know that's true? But we do know this, don't we? There is proof. There's proof in the prophecies. There's proof in the archaeological history. There is proof in just our own hearts. We know what is right about us and about God, don't we? And um, these, we know these things to be true. Yes, it takes some faith, but I'm always thankful that God doesn't just sit there and say, put all you see and all you know and all the facts aside and just trust me. He instead says, trust me. And oh, by the way, there's a lot of facts to back this up. <laughs> I've got eyewitness accounts. I've got the prophecies. I've got the word. I've got my promises. I've got all of these things. But we do need to take it with a little faith, don't we? In fact, I want everybody to go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, which is where we ended up last week. 1 Peter chapter 2. We have this admonition from Peter to the people. Uh, he was a leader in the early church, and he is writing to the churches, uh, trying to make sure they understand. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he says... Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. And really, when he's listing that, he's saying, these are the words of who? Words of the world. This is the way the world speaks. 
This is, these are their words. Their words are words of malice, words of guile, words of hypocrisies and envies and evil speaking. They are intended to boast of themselves and to cause what is best for them and to trick people and deceive people and create hate and those kinds of things. Judgment, that's the words of the world, right? Instead, what should we desire? Verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Because if we fill our lives with words of malice, guile, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, we will not grow. In fact, we will, as they do in the song, whenever we sing with little kids, shrink, 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 right? Down to nothing. But if we stick to the truth, the word of God, the sincere milk of the word of God, then we will grow thereby again. There is blessing in the word of God, isn't there? There's a blessing in knowing what it is and how it has been given us, and it should be our desire to study it. Well, tonight, we're going to go to another passage. Let's all go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And tonight's message is called, What is it good for? Like absolutely everything. Don't go that way. I know you're right in their minds going through the war song. <laughs> I did that on purpose. So it's okay. But no, what is it good for? We say it's a blessing. We say we can grow thereby. But here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, we have Paul writing to a young minister named Timothy. Um, Timothy, who uh, grew up in a Christian family where they knew the Word of God, they studied the Word of God, and he now is becoming a minister. And he wants to make sure he understands what is the Word of God good for, because Timothy's going to be teaching it, right? Just as Peter taught it, just as Paul taught it, just as Jesus taught it. What is it good for? How can it impact our life? And that's what 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says is all about. Let's take a look at it. And let's start with the very first part. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. So all scripture is inspired. And that word inspired, you kind of break it apart, it kind of means like God breathed. Now did God sit there and he kind of like sit on, you know, next to Isaiah and say, okay, write this and then this and then dictate the whole thing and sat there with Jeremiah, sat there with Paul saying, write this, write this, write this. No, uh, that's not how it works. But they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we all know what that feels like. It's kind of like, yeah, I, I should do this. <laughs> I should. And as they sat down the road, they were guided in their words. Very different styles in writing, very different perspectives, but all inspired by the word of God. And the important word there is really this. How much of the Word of God is the Word of God? All of it. And this is important because, and this isn't new to this day and age. This, is, this battle's been going on from the very beginning. Where people sometimes want to say, well, that's the Word of God because I like it. <laughs> uh, it makes me feel good. I like that. That's the Word of God. Or, hey, um, you know, it allows me to judge those people over there. So I really like that part because they're doing it all wrong. And if I can use the word of God against them, fantastic. That's the word of God then. But if it starts kind of encroaching on my freedom, kind of starts, uh, you know, pricking at me and starts saying, I'm doing something wrong, then it becomes what? Well, that's just some suggestions by some people long ago. That's not really the word of God. And can we do that? Can we just sit there and say, pick and choose? I decide this is the word of God and that's not. If we do that, what are we running afoul of that we learned last week? It is not a matter of private interpretation. If we start picking apart the word of God and saying, well, in my viewpoint, that's the word of God and I must obey it and you must obey it. But this part over here, not so much. Those are more just suggestions or ideas. Who is the one eventually determining what the word of God is? Me. And then it all falls apart, doesn't it? 
Because by that logic, everybody can just pick whatever part they like, right? And then what comes of the doctrines of salvation, even? Or the doctrines of creation? Or the doctrines of any of these things? I mean, where we just get to choose what we want to believe and what we believe is the Word of God. That's why it's important that here we have Paul very clearly saying to Timothy, what? All Scripture is given by what? inspiration of God. God wanted us to know these things. God wanted us to be instructed by these things. And he wanted to make sure these were preserved for us, for our good. Okay? So all scripture is inspired. In fact, back in, keep a ribbon or something in 2 Timothy, but let's go back to 2 Peter. Chapter 1 from our passage last week. And we have Peter here kind of uh, saying the same thing, but being a little clearer on the process. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is any private interpretation, right? So we just talked about that. It's not somebody's private idea. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's what we mean by inspired. God breathes. The Holy Spirit would move through them to write these truths down. Because frankly, if they were just writing whatever was on the top of their head, how many would agree Peter would have gotten something wrong? Paul would have gotten something wrong, something based on his own ideas, something he'd learned before, some ideas he had about this, that, or the other thing. In fact, if it was up to man, how good would this book be? How much could it be trusted if this was just, this is what I think is good. This is what I think is right. It, yeah, as much as anybody can be trusted, which isn't a whole because <laughs> we all come with baggage, don't we? A mental baggage, so ideas that we have of what is right and what is wrong. We have to trust that it is God who said, this is truth, and move them to write these things down. So all Scripture is inspired. All Scripture is also what? Let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. If it is all from God, then it is all also what? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and all of it is profitable. If it's of God, then it's profitable. Now, what do we mean by profitable? Daniel, let's say you have a business. What kind of business do you want to run? Just name something. Private security company. All right? That sound good? Now, let's say in the year... You brought in income of $100,000. Does that sound pretty good? Income of $100,000? But your expenditures were $105,000. How'd you do last year? Not good. You're in the hole $5,000 because you have no what? Profit. <laughs> now, Derek over here runs a competing security company, right? And you made $200,000 last year. And you even cut your expenses, so you have $75,000 expenses for $200,000 income. Now, you have what? $125,000 in profit. Profit is gain, something that is gain. How many like profits? There's only some, like, warped people for tax purposes, I guess, who don't want profits sometimes. I don't understand those people. If, we have, if that's our tax system, I think we should just throw it out. IRS, do not come after me. And so, <laughs> that's, it's a perverse thing, right, to say we don't want profit. You want profit. How many want things that profit your life? Have gain, positive, good gain to your life. We all have things in our life that do not profit us, Right? But we also have things in our life we know that profit us. And this is one of those things. We know that the scripture, all of it, even when we may not like what it says, even when we may not understand what it says, even when it's like all kind of murky to us, is it still profitable to us? It adds to our life. The word of God never returns what? Void. 
It always brings profit to anybody who receives it, right? Heeds it, right? So it is profitable. All Scripture is inspired, breathed by God, inspired by God, and all Scripture is profitable. And he breaks it down into four specific areas that it is profitable to us. There are others. <laughs> there are many other ways that the Word of God is profitable to us. But he picks four in particular, and when he's talking to a pastor, these are kind of important, right? Uh, as you're trying to get people to grow in their spiritual walk. These are very important things. So let's run through them tonight. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. We've got that. And is profitable for specifically for what? And the first one is for doctrine. And everybody just fell asleep. Doctrine. Oh, boring. Doctrine. Teach. All it means is teachings. <laughs> How many like a good story in the Bible like David and Goliath? Very exciting. Did you know that there is doctrine in the story of David and Goliath? <laughs> Did you know there's doctrine in the story of Noah, the story of Jonah? That all the stories have doctrine in it, don't they? Teachings. Because all that means is these are teachings of God. Things that he wants us to know. Know about what? Well, know about him know about us, know about salvation, know about forgiveness, know about mercy and grace, to know about judgment. As I'm saying those words, can you picture stories from the Bible, passages of the Bible that relate to those things? Yes, because the Word of God is what? Profitable for teaching. In fact, it is in Matthew chapter 15. Let's go there. Again, keep something in 2 Timothy. We're coming back real quick. But in Matthew chapter 15, we have a warning here from Jesus about what was going on in his time. Were there people during the time of Jesus who were teaching the word of God? Yes and no. No. <laughs> Because some of them forgot that they should be teaching the word of God and decided to instead to teach the word of who? Word of man. Specifically the Pharisees in particular, but some of the Sadducees as well. Chief priests and scribes. We're all getting into this. In fact, he notes this in Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. But in vain they, these teachers, do, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of who? Of men. And we have to be careful here, don't we? As people go to church, as pastors teach, as Sunday school teachers teach, as uh, Saturday club teachers teach, we need to make sure what we are teaching aligns 100% with what? God's Word. We need to be teaching God's Word because that is the teaching that is worthwhile. If we start getting off into other philosophies, other ideas, other concepts, other issues, and start teaching those things as the teachings of God, but really they're just the teachings and ideas of men, do we have a problem? Yes, we do. Because the Word of God is profitable, the Word of man is not always profitable, is it? And we have to be careful that we're making sure we're teaching the Word of God because it is profitable for teaching. In fact, look at Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Paul notes, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our what? Learning. What is he talking about? Everything in the Old Testament. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm a New Testament person. You know, Jesus came. That's what I want to talk about. No. The Old Testament, too. It was all written and preserved for us for our what? Learning because it is doctrine that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That's a gain, isn't it? 
How many find hope in some of these stories of the Old Testament? Some of these things from history. That is the forgiveness. Even if you do something as bad as David, is there forgiveness? The doctrine of forgiveness. Even if you've lived a life like Samson, is there still reconciliation? Is there still hope? As you look at these stories of mercy and forgiveness and all these things, and that's the thing. How much of the Old Testament is doctrine? It's really all of it, right? It's there to teach us, again, about God, his character, and all those things. The story of their release from Egypt and his care for them through the wilderness and the rebellion as they went into the promised land and then had to go back later uh, because they actually went into the promised land and God's victories. And it's all doctrine. It all teaches us something that we can learn. That's why it's so disturbing that so many people nowadays just want to say, ah, the Old Testament, those aren't real stories. They didn't really happen. They're just stories made up by people just to try to give us ideas or how to best live our life. People teach that. People in churches, people in synagogues, people out there claiming to love God teach those things because they have turned the word of God into the teachings of men. But it is not, is it? It is the word of God, therefore it is all profitable for teaching. It's worth learning. How many times have I ever heard some kids say, well, I've got to learn this. I'm never going to use it. About math, English, you know, all those stupid things that, I don't know about you, but I've never used any of those things in my life. Since I got out of school, I never used math or English or writing or reading, any of that stuff ever again. Right, Daniel? Once you graduate, you don't have to use any of that stuff, right? <laughs> Wrong. Here, though, don't get that idea. What have I got to learn about David? What have I got to learn about Jonah? What have I got to learn about some minor prophet? Well, it's to our prophet, <laughs> right? That we learn from these things, that we understand these things, that the Holy Spirit can teach us many things from these. And that also brings us to the New Testament as well. Same there, isn't it? All written for our learning so that we would have hope. Hope in knowing that we'll get through this life. That's what it's trying to teach us, is God's love and mercy and salvation and all those things that are so important to us. So it is profitable for teaching so we can learn about God, about ourselves, about the world around us, about how we're supposed to live, and all of that it is good for teaching. It is also good for reproof. It is profitable for doctrine and reproof. And reproof can be really looked at as two different things. Uh, one, it can be looked at as reproof being a test to test you, challenge you. A challenge is a reproof to challenge what you're doing, to challenge the way you think, to make sure you, well, what would be the purpose then? If it's the word of God and it's the truth, is to make sure you are acting in accordance with what? The truth and are thinking in accordance with the truth. So it will challenge, it will test, it will also convict not like, you know, convict like you're off to prison, but convict like, hey, you're wrong. <laughs> now that we've tested, we found out you're wrong, and this is why you're wrong, right? So the Word of God is good for telling us, for testing us, and also then telling us where we are wrong. In fact, let's look at a couple of passages. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. By the way, those at home, if you're curious, uh, because it looks really hot in here, uh, it is. It is. I walked in this evening, and it was 92 degrees in here. And the air conditioner is not helping <laughs> that much, very fast. All right. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And the writer of Hebrews says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That is just a beautiful phrase. <laughs> you just get the picture. The Word of God just gets down into your very soul. Just as you read it, it will challenge you, won't it? It will pierce you through. It will say, hey, pay attention here. 
You can't, we can try to just go through our life just assuming everything's all right. You're okay. I'm okay, right? Let's just go through life. I'm never going to examine myself. I'm never going to look in the mirror, right? But the Word of God doesn't let us get away with that. It is profitable for putting up a mirror in front of our face and saying, look. And it doesn't look just at the outer face. Where does it go? It gets down in our very soul. It gets down into our very being. Our thoughts and motives. Our desires and goals. And it tests them and says, hey, are you right? <laughs> are you in line with the will of God? Are you who God intended you to be? That's what the Word of God do, does. It tests us. And that's why a lot of people, they say what? I'd rather not. <laughs> I hate it. Every time I open the Bible, all I find is things that tell me I'm doing something wrong. Well, let me ask you something. Is that why you don't go to the doctor? And is that smart? Because I don't know about you, but I'd just rather not know that I'm sick. <laughs> right? I'd rather not catch it early. I'd just really just rather just go through my life and just ignore the whole thing until I just drop dead. Right? Isn't that better? Or is it? God wants to bless. God wants to improve our life. He's not doing this as a gotcha. He's not trying to make you feel bad. He's trying to make you understand that he's got something better for you. Right? And he uses the word of God to get in there and slice down in the middle and say, hey, you've got a problem here. And then to convict us. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. To tell us, hey, you're wrong. <laughs> and boy, Paul writes a lot of that stuff. Jesus said a lot of that too. In fact, you go to his Sermon on the Mount. What do you find in the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus saying what? You're wrong. <laughs> you're supposed to be the light of the world. Let me explain all the ways, ways you're wrong. You've been taught this. It's wrong. This is the truth. You've been taught this. You think this. You do this. That is the word of God. What? Reproving. You're wrong. Okay? Again, not to sit there and slap you around, make fun of you and say, oh, aren't you a terrible person because you're wrong in these areas, but to say, hey, you're wrong. It's like if you had a small child who was about to put a, you know, a wire into the electrical. What would you say? Would you say, hey, you're wrong, don't do that? Or would you say, ah, they'll find out. You'd let them know, don't do that, right? And he's saying, don't do it. In fact, here's a good example of that in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 7. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become as saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an adulterer has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain, empty words. For because of these things, these sins, comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And his thing here is, people in Ephesus were starting to think, oh, it doesn't matter if I sin or not. Who cares? What's the big deal? And what's his, his job as a writer, being moved by the Holy Ghost, is what? You're wrong. <laughs> Don't let people deceive you. How many times? Paul uses that phrase a lot. How you are easily deceived. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, right? All those say, hey, you're wrong. Your, your thinking is wrong. What you're being taught is wrong. And we need to what? Correct it, right? And is it important to be reproved? To look at the mirror. To examine ourselves by the truth of the word of God. And also be told, you can't do this. <laughs> These are bad for you. Don't do them, right? These are important things because our minds are a little warped, <laughs> right? Yes. You mentioned looking in the mirror, and I think we can, you know, we believe that if we can fool ourselves, oh, yeah. and we can read without really seeing it, mm -hmm. and, you know, our heart responds to what matters, right? It, it won't just be like that's against our will. Like, we have to let, let it do its work and be willing to do exactly. it. Exactly. 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 So let it. Let it test you. Let it challenge you. And let it tell you where you're wrong, because then it will also 
do what? It is also profitable for correction. God is not in, it's not a part of his game plan. He's not in it to sit there and say, you're wrong, try again. You're wrong, try again. You're wrong, try again. He wants us to get it what? Right. <laughs> so it is also good for correction. I love the word correction because what it really means is straighten up again. <laughs> it's very more, much restorative. We want to correct your behavior and get you back on the right path. That's the whole purpose of the correction. In fact, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Same book. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. Paul's going to give them some correction. Here's the changes you need to make. He's not going to just say, hey, don't do that. Instead, he's also going to say what? Do this. And that's important. So we know what is right. Starting in verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Okay? Don't do that. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. In other words, they're wrong, right? And this is a reproof. Don't be like them. Don't walk in blindness. Don't walk in darkness. Look at verse 20. But you have not so what? Learned Christ. That's not what you've learned. You've learned a correct way. So I'm not just going to tell you that way is wrong. I'm also going to say this is the right way to walk. Verse 21, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, way of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So you get the two sides. Reproof is take off that old man. Don't do it that way, but the correction is what? Put on the new man, which you have learned from his word, from his doctrines. You know that way, because the truth is in Christ. Then he just gives some examples. Verse 25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Don't do it this way, what? Do it this way, right? For we are members of one another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that need. I love that part, because it's not just what? Don't steal. It's what? Let's, the better thing to do is what? Work. Because <laughs> when you work, you then have more to give to others. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. So again, don't do this. Reproof. Don't do evil communication, but here's the correction. How should we use our mouth? to edify and build up. And this is something Paul does a lot. This is what the Word of God does a lot. It doesn't just say, don't do this. It also says, and here's the better way. Right? There's a second part of correction, too. 1 John 1, 9. I bet we don't even have to turn there. Because the second part of correction is the restoration. The straighten up again so that we can have that relationship again with him. It's also the word of God teaches us that even when we do wrong and we are reproved for having done wrong, committed sin, is there correction that makes us right with God again? And what is that corrective action? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's that corrective action. And again, that's not just a New Testament idea. That's in the Old Testament too, right? What did David write? Create in me a clean heart, right? Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. I want to hear joy again. I want to restore my relationship with you, Lord. That's my, my greatest desire. And we are taught over and over again in the Old Testament. We're taught over and over again in the New Testament. That corrective way of being restored again to God, even though we have done wrong. That's good to know, isn't it? Isn't there hope there? 
So it is good for doctrine, teachings. It is good for reproof, testing, and conviction of when we're wrong. Also for correction, though. Straighten us up. What is the right path? What is the right thing to do? And how can I be restored again in that relationship with God? And then finally, it is instruction in righteousness, which the word instruction is more like training. Training in righteousness. Not all training has to come from, you did wrong, do it this way. <laughs> we can actually train in righteousness without making the mistakes, can't we? Can we? I hope so. I always tell the kids, I mean, I'll say this over and over, I will say this until I pass. The worst thing you can do is not learn from your own mistakes. That is the absolute worst thing you can do. And there are people, we all do this, right? Not learn from our own mistakes. It is better to learn from your mistakes, right? What's best, though? Learn from other people's mistakes. Because <laughs> then you don't have... The punishment, right? That's the best. And the training in righteousness is God's way of saying, hey, I want to train you. And why do we need to be trained? Why does a child need to learn to walk? Why does a child need to learn to speak? Why do we need to learn to write and to read? Because we are not able to do it. Same way here. We need to be trained to do righteousness because we do not do righteousness on our own. <laughs> right? That's not what comes natural. So there is training. The Word of God is good for training in how to live a life pleasing unto the Lord. And again, that's in a lot of the stories. That is in a lot of the teachings. That is in what Jesus taught us. It is what the prophets taught us. It is in what the apostles taught us. In fact, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Starting in verse 1. 1 Corinthians 10, 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and also passed through the sea. So he's going back and he's taking a story from the Old Testament, right? He's talking about how when they came out of Egypt, a cloud they followed. Pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night, right? And then they also passed through the Red Sea, right? They all went and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat, that manna, right? And all did drink the same spiritual drink when he provided water. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. In other words, we are told that story of all the mistakes they made, how they whined and complained, how they rebelled against God, how they made the, you know, the golden idol, how they refused to go in. All of that, we are told that story so that we will be trained in what? Righteousness, not to lust after things of this world, not to lust in the ideas and things of this world and idolize them. In fact, he goes further. Verse 7, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. <laughs> Do sinfully. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Because of their sin, God punished them. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and whined, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. <laughs> All of that is written down. All these stories are written down. Even the stories of Paul and Peter and James and John. And all of these instructions are so that we know and we can learn from the mistakes, can't we? We can learn from Jonah. That when God says go, what should we do? Go, there's no running from God, right? We can learn from Solomon not to allow ourselves to be drawn into the idolatrous ways of this world. We can learn from Samson. We can learn from Gideon who after his great victories as a leader was a disaster, <laughs> right? 
We can learn from these things, learn from their mistakes, learn from the, the various you know, parables of Jesus. All for our what? What's the, what's the purpose of all this? Our righteousness. So we will walk the right path. Now if we don't, will we also re receive the reproof? Yes. Will we also receive the correction and the restoration? Yes. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that if we do go down the wrong path, he will go as far as to chastise us. Anybody want to guess what that word chastise means? It's exactly the same word as instruction. <laughs> Train. <laughs> He will train us. And sometimes the training requires a what? A paddling, right? That's a paddling. And sometimes it requires that because he loves us, right? And that's what we should learn from that. That's the teaching from all this, is that he loves us enough to what? Instruct us and correct us and reprove us and to teach us all these things. And where do we find all the things we've talked about tonight? The Word of God. And as we read it, as we study it, as we hear it at church, the Holy Spirit will work in our heart and make it profitable. For whatever purpose. And I have read some passages, and I've come away with it with teachings. Sometimes I'll read that very same passage, and I will come back with a reproof. <laughs> Saying, hey, you're not doing that right. And sometimes I'll come, read that same passage and come up with a correction. Hey, I learned something. This is what I should be doing, right? And sometimes I'll just come up with what? Nice training in righteousness. This is what I should be doing. Not that I'm not doing it, not that I need to make any change, but I need to be doing this. This is how I should be conducting myself. It's all there. It's all in his word. And the Holy Spirit will make this real to us and work these things in us so that we will be what? What's the purpose of all of this? Let's go back to 2 Timothy. That was all just verse 16. Now we'll have an equal amount of time for verse 17. Just kidding. <laughs> Everybody's looking at the clock and knows that's not true. <laughs> so let's look at verse 17. 2 Timothy 3, 17. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's the purpose of all this. That's the purpose of the teachings, the reproof, the correction, the training, is all that we would be the person that God intended us to be. Perfect in our walk, mature in our walk. Not absolutely holy, we're never going to get there. That's why we still need the reproof and the correction <laughs> and the training, right? We still need these things. But so that we will be mature, we will not be blown to and fro by every wind of man's doctrines and ideas and things. We will know the truth. We'll be mature and grounded. And we will be thoroughly furnished, having all the tools that we need to do whatever work God has for us. Because let's face facts. If we go out there and we do what God wants us to do, will somebody take notice? And will somebody try to stop us? And will somebody try to in, kind of inject lies and deception into that process. Yeah, that's why the Word of God is so important, isn't it? To keep us on the right path, doing the works of God as He intended. In fact, He gives us some help. Last place we're going tonight. Ephesians chapter 4 again. This time verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4 starting in verse 11. When Jesus ascended, as we've taught about and talked about on Sunday morning a couple of times, he sent gifts, didn't he, unto men. And one of those is his church. And God sent us his church. People like Peter and Paul and John, the apostles, right? People like pastors and Sunday school teachers, thinking back over your life, all the people in your life, parents who were there to help you along the way, right? To do what? 
And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the what? For the perfecting of the saints, for the growth and maturity of the saints, for the work of the ministry to help one another, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. They're going to be there. They're going to try to get in there. They're going to try to knock us off. But if we have the word of God, it is always profitable. It is always to our gain. It is always helpful. It's not the doctrines. It's not the fables and ideas of men. It is the truth of God, therefore it is good for us. And it causes us to grow and to be mature and have a grounding. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Right? That we may be like him, be part of him in this world, right? So that we will grow and mature and be grounded in the truth. That's why. We have the Word of God. That's why it's important to study it. That's why it's important to desire it as the sincere milk that we need to grow, right? So that is what the Word of God is for. And like I said, those are nice four things. It does so much more than that. <laughs> and as you study it, uh, it could have put in there encouragements, uh, gives hope, gives peace, causes joy, <laughs> Uh, it causes us to love. I mean, there's so much in there, isn't there? Uh, it's such, it is so profitable to us. It should be something we desire to have part of our life, that we are willing and desire to study it and know it. And also do what? Spread it around, right? Could this world use more of God's teachings? Some reproof, but also, again, God's not all about reproof. He's also more, more concerned about correction getting us where we need to be, and in training in righteousness. The world needs it. Well, that's got to start with who? It's got to start with the church, teaching the saints, and the saints going to all the world, right? So next week, we will kind of riff off what we just talked about, how there will be deception. We'll talk about false prophets. There's a good passage in Peter that we'll go over, just reminding us that as we go about this, uh, got to remember, there's always going to be people out there wanting to lie, and some of them will even be wearing sheep's clothing. So you got to be careful. They're always with us. So that's why we have to be particularly sure that we're sticking to what? The Word of God, not the doctrines of men.